everybody, welcome to System Crafter. I'm David Wilson. Whoa! My microphone's way over there, sorry about that. Hello everybody, welcome to System Crafters. I'm David Wilson, and today we're back with another uh, episode of System Crafters Live. It's our Friday live stream where we get together and talk about all things Emacs, geeks, and whatever is cool this week. Uh, it seems that my desktop audio is not working for some reason. That's really weird. Let me see if I can fix that. Yeah. Not playing. Are you hearing music at all, anyone? Because I'm not seeing it here. Ah, that's why. Probably just got blasted with audio. Ah. Okay. So, as usual, having, uh, you know, difficulties with the new streaming setup because of uh, using a different computer. And I'm trying a few new things today, so hopefully it's not going to blow up entirely. We'll see how it goes. I also think I have a solution to the um, the issue we were having with the camera freezing, which is fantastic if it actually works. Why does it not let me put a higher value than that? Yeah, whatever. It seems to be using a fair amount of CPU today, so we'll see how things go. But uh, anyway... Let me just say hello to some folks who are here today. Valentino, Arya, Johan, uh, Medri, John, Robert, F23A, let's see, Pavel, Daigo, Tomas, GK Sudo, Demis, uh, Mark, did I say hi to Mark? Wow, my microphone is not happy with me today. Uh, Marcus, Tomas, Nova, Jeff, Marcin, Rune, Rodislav, Amlesh, uh, Pampers Booty, Johan, Tori, hey Tori, uh, let's see, Resab, Jeff, lots of people here, Rui, Mohammed, hey everybody, nice to, ha nice to have you all here today, let me see if I can pull up another thing here, all right, so yeah, um, <laughs> The ongoing saga of the problems I've been having with my streaming setup. As you might be able to tell, my um, camera is running really slow at the moment. Give me one second and see if I can diagnose why. Once again, we're having weird issues with the um, window placement, which is so strange because I've taken all the stuff out that should be affecting that, but it's still happening. I don't know if uh, org present is causing it somehow. All right, let's get this open. Firefox is giving me some trouble here. I bet I know why, too. Let me pause this preview display. Does that help? Yeah, I think that actually brought it down some. Wow, okay. Let me see if I can pull this back to where it was before. There we are, okay. Yes, problems everywhere. Okay, I think it's much better now. At least the video on my screen seems to be working okay. So, hey, what's up? All right, so let's see. Let me give you a rundown of where things are currently with the uh, the streaming setup problems. So, uh, the last few weeks, those of you who, um, who've been here on the live streams the last few weeks know that I've been having issues with... I, I, I actually blew up what my machine that I use for streaming every week. Um, man, this cable that I'm using here is really bad too. Anyway, um, so I usually use a different laptop for streaming and recording videos. And what happened was uh, I changed the setting in the BIOS because I wanted to try and use the uh, integrated graphics. Uh, sorry, the discrete graphics card, the NVIDIA graphics card. So I'm streaming with a laptop, which is a little bit insane, but it's what I'm doing because it's what I have. Uh, so I changed the BIOS setting from the hybrid graphics to just using the discrete graphics and for whatever reason I was on a version of the BIOS of my laptop that had a bug that when you change the setting it completely bricks your motherboard so I had to send that computer into Lenovo to get fixed and now I'm having to use a different computer which is not as powerful uh, for the purpose of doing my streams and I basically had to just like redo my entire streaming setup with this computer um, and the last maybe two weeks or maybe three, how long has it been now? Um, it's, it's been kind of a challenge. So I think I've gotten things dialed in better this week compared to previous weeks. I actually have my external display working again. Uh, I think I fixed the issue with the camera freezing thanks to the new, um, OBS 27 RC. 
So hopefully today we will have less issues. If you ever see my camera freeze, let me know in the chat, but um, I think it won't because of the setting that I have turned on now. Basically what happens is that there's a new setting where if your uh, capture device starts dropping frames, uh, OBS will restart it automatically. So I was having to go do that myself every time and sometimes it wouldn't work, but I was doing some test streaming yesterday and it, it lasted for a while. So um, hopefully today it will also work well for me. So um, today I want to talk about the uh, new Magit version that just came out, version 3.0. Um, I am a little unprepared for that because of all the issues I was having this morning trying to get everything set up. But uh, before I get into that, I wanted to talk about something else that I've been working on in my free time over the last week or two. Maybe it's just been a week. I can't remember exactly when I started on this. But um, what I, one thing I've been doing is uh, working on a new Emacs package, which I'm calling Live Crafter right now, which basically allows me to control my stream using Emacs Lisp. And it sounds a little bit insane, but it actually works quite well. Um, let me see. Is, is the music volume okay for everybody? Because I'm, I'm, I'm playing music differently today, and I want to make sure that it's not too loud. So uh, this package that I'm working on um, basically allows me to connect to uh, OBS and also to the YouTube API so that I can get access to things like the, the live chat of the stream um, and pretty much any other information I could get from my channel. And be able to integrate it into Emacs while I'm streaming. So instead of having this uh, a pain here with the tr traditional U YouTube live chat UI, I can actually have the live chat embedded into Emacs and have a more sort of smooth experience rather than having this window over here. All right, so let me just, uh, let's try knocking it down a few notches here and then see if that makes it any better. Yeah, that's a little bit lower. Okay, so um, a few things that I'm going to do with this. First of all, I'm going to try to automate the entire flow of the stream from start to finish. So to actually kick off the stream, there's a few things that I have to do manually, which is kind of a pain and um, not, not very nice whenever you're in a hurry like I was this morning and trying to get everything going. Uh, first of all, you have to like open OBS, which obviously is the thing you do anyway. You have to click the start streaming button in OBS, then you have to go to the YouTube live streaming page and wait until the stream becomes active, then you have to click go live. And then I would have to go and like start the background music for the intro, make sure I was on the right scene for the logo screen, then manually with, my, with the mouse click and fade the volume down before I then turn it to the, the scene you're seeing right now with me talking, and then uh, start start the stream. So there's a lot of steps that are annoying to do every time and this is basically the same steps for recording as well. So now I've written Emacs Lisp code that will um, automate most of that. I haven't gotten all the way yet to where I can kick off the stream and, and get everything going, but all, a lot of the pieces are in place. So uh, also playing background music and controlling the fade is something I can do automatically now. I actually do have that code written uh, with the help of a Emacs package called mpv.el. So I'm basically using the mpv media player to play a playlist of songs, the same songs that you normally hear, um, but I'm controlling it through Emacs and I can control the volume by sending messages to that MPV process using the mpv.el package, which has worked out quite nicely. The, the fade is pretty smooth. Um, I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. So now no more clicking on buttons, dragging the slider up and down to control the volume and getting it wrong every time. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to do that. Uh, let me see if I can pull that out really quickly. I don't know how visible this is, but um, basically I have a function for starting the music where I'm just calling this MPV start function uh, to kick off the MPV process with some parameters that I want. And then I can run this uh, live crafter fade music function and then that will ask me for a target volume if I run it inter interactively. And then that will kick off to this uh, fade function that sort of gets called in a loop. And um, I'm using like a linear interpolation calculation for um, calculating what the volume should be at any point while this loop keeps running. So I'm basically updating this, calling this function maybe like uh, every quarter of a second, I think, and then setting the volume based on what the volume should be at that point in time based on the duration of the fade. So a little bit too much information probably, but um, it was fun to write. I enjoyed writing it and it was all possible to do in Emacs Lisp. So um, this, could be useful to people in general. I'm not planning on 
publishing it anytime soon because I need to work through a lot of the scenarios and maybe decide if some of these parts should be separated out into separate packages. But um, it's a great, it's been a great opportunity for me to write some more Emacs Lisp and you know do something that's a little bit more involved. Uh, speaking of involved, actually authenticating with the Google API or Google OAuth backend and then calling the YouTube APIs has been pretty fun. There's actually uh, functions in Emacs Lisp that you can use for making HTTP requests and getting the responses back. And then there's already a JSON library built in so you can parse the JSON responses. So I was able to use all that to um, basically uh, make direct requests to the YouTube API and then get the information to do whatever I want with it in Emacs Lisp. And it's been pretty straightforward. The only problem that I ran into in the end was that apparently the quota that you get for making API requests to the YouTube data APIs and the and live streaming APIs is pretty low. And if you are to pull the live chat API to like for let's say a two hour stream, the amount of quota that you get per, per day for the YouTube API or for the Google APIs in general is is too low for even like 30 minutes of streaming. So for two hours, I definitely can't do it without being very careful about um, how how often I poll. So whenever I show the live chat integration, I'm basically polling every five seconds for new new messages because I'm trying to make sure I don't run out of quota and then not be able to poll anymore that day. So it's just like the, the kind of issues that you have to deal with when you're dealing with cloud APIs and trying to uh, you know, do some interesting integrations in our programs, but I don't know it's been a fun project so far. Maybe in a future stream, I'll do a little bit of live coding on it. And if people are interested, um, to add some more functionality, probably I'll mess with it a little bit here. Cause I, I don't have it fully set back up the right way to, to do the live chat. I want to show it if I can do it right now. Jeff says, I never had any kind of success doing the Google version of OAuth and Emacs Lisp. Um, tried several hours, never got it working. Yeah. So I tried using the OAuth 2 package um, that someone else wrote for this, and it didn't work for me. I also tried using the request package for making uh, requests. Um, and that also, something about the way that it encoded query parameters didn't work with the scopes that I was sending over to Google. I don't know why, but uh, I had to start making my own request directly using the uh, URL retrieve function, which is built into Emacs. So when, when I started doing that, I had a lot more success. Um, and it's not it's not that complicated, but it does require that you set up a um, a listener. I'm using the HTTP D. What is it called? Simple HTTP D package to set up an actual web server in Emacs that listens for the authentication callback from Google whenever I authenticate successfully. That's the way that Emacs is able to pick up that token that gets sent back uh, from Google. So uh, one, maybe one day I'll explain that in a more coherent fashion. Right now I'm just sort of rambling based on what I know, but um, it's it's been pretty fun. Hey, Eric, uh, did I ever get the Java LSP to work? I have not tried in a while. Um, I've been bouncing all over the pro all over the place of projects over the past couple of weeks. Another project that I've been doing that I um, it's not fully baked yet, but it is fairly usable at the moment is, uh, let's see, uh, github.com slash system crafters slash geeks installer. So I've actually got a GitHub actions workflow that will build a, an ISO of the geeks installer with the full Linux kernel. So if any of you, any of you out there want to try geeks and you don't want to have to set up geeks so they can build your own image. Uh, you can download this Geeks installer here, and it's basically an ISO that you can burn to a USB stick or to a CD and then boot into, well, not a CD, maybe a DVD, you, and boot into uh, the Geeks installation environment, but actually have the full Linux kernel so that your Wi-Fi devices and stuff will work. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to build this out a little bit more to make it easier to set up Geeks, and I'm doing this as a lead up to making the full Geeks installation video. So for those of you who are waiting for that, this is actually the first step towards getting that video done because I wanted to make it easy for people to use the full Linux kernel when they do their installation, because otherwise you probably won't be able to connect to the internet. So uh, this is something that's going to be coming. I'll, I'll announce it properly whenever it's really done, but I just sort of wanted to let you know that it's uh, that is happening. I'll actually drop that into the chat in case anybody wants to click on it. Let's see. So a few other people have showed up here. Uh, hi to uh, Marcel, uh, Diego. 
uh, Echo, Marduk, uh, Pedro, Appenzel. Yeah, so I've been pretty busy with projects and whatnot over the last week or two. Um, and I've been having a lot of fun with that, but it's uh, I haven't gotten back to the LSP mode videos at all. Uh, sorry for that, but you know, there's a lot of things to do. Too, too many topics to cover in this channel, thankfully. Because if, it, if there weren't enough topics to cover, we wouldn't be here right now, probably. All right, let's see. Let me see. What was the thing I want to do next? Uh, what else did I want to say about this? So, yeah, uh, displaying stream chat directly. So that is possible. I've got it working. Um, I might try to run it right now and see what happens. Uh, one thing I really would like to do with that is to be able to identify System Craft sponsors in the chat. So maybe color their name differently in the chat. Just so that people who are sponsoring the channel get sort of like special placement. Uh, something we can't do right now in the normal YouTube chat because uh, YouTube doesn't let me, you know, do anything to their chat display. If I were to set up membership on this channel, then you would see special icons for people who are members of the channel. But I don't want to use YouTube for that because they, uh, I, I don't want to be, I don't want people to be locked into YouTube as the way to sponsor the channel. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, what else? Live notifications for new sponsors and donations. Yeah, so these pop-ups that you normally see uh, in the corner of my screen, I'll have other things that pop up there as well, which would be pretty cool. Then we could do things like polling. I could set up polls and then have the poll results be displayed in Emacs and, and even possibly do crazy things, which probably isn't a good idea, but things like viewer-controlled Emacs commands. So, you know, the use viewers could then try to, like, control my Emacs through the stream, which might be kind of uh, scary or maybe interesting. Uh, Eric says you should do separate and dedicated videos on Java and all those. Yeah, uh, I'm going to do dedicated videos on a variety of languages, but I just haven't gotten back to it yet. Uh, Luis says, what are you using to get the diagnostics in Elisp? That's a uh, fly check. So fly check mode. I'm pretty sure that's it. Yeah, if I turn fly check mode off, they go away. So then I turned it back on and they didn't come back. That's fun. Oh, there, there it was. It just took a while. Uh, GK Sudo says, uh, do you have your config.scm on your GitHub? I'm having trouble with issues with the NVIDIA drivers. You know, I never got the NVIDIA drivers to work, to be honest. Um, somebody else told me that it worked for them, but I haven't had the same luck. I do have my stuff on GitHub. Um, let's see. If you actually just go, yeah, it's on GitHub, but if you go to config.davywheel.com slash systems then you'll also see the uh, setup here. And I I have a few different files that is actually sort of split up across multiple files here. But uh, you'll, you'll see the, the system configuration. I have a base config, and then I have um, per machine configurations that inherit from that. So you can check that out there. Uh, yeah, Matthew says you might want to consider Twitch or else uh, that makes these things a lot easier to implement. Don't think it's even possible on YouTube. Uh, which part? The um, uh, doing special things in the chat, like in the built-in chat or just like getting the chat information? One thing that is nice with Twitch is that I think that for um, for the stream chat, you can actually use it over IRC, which is pretty awesome. But uh, I really don't want to use Twitch, mainly because I like the fact that on YouTube it saves recordings and I don't have to do anything special to have recordings be saved for my videos and it makes all my stuff show up in one place. Now, obviously, if I were to stream on Twitch and record the stream at the same time, then I could upload the video later. But I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like it's going to be more fun for me to try to do something with YouTube and do it custom. And then whatever I do there could also work on Twitch if I decided I want to stream on Twitch, too. Let's see what else here. Yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about related to that. Let's see if I can get the live chat uh, thing working. Hmm, let's see. I might need to go to my other screen here and load something real quick because I haven't loaded it yet. So this is a live crafter. Got my keys file basically that I want to try to load up. Okay, I think that's better now. Hop back over here. Matthew says, the Twitch streams I watch automatically upload VODs on YouTube, but that multiplies platforms, so not ideal. Yeah, I just, I kind of like being on YouTube primarily. 
Um, it just works better for me. So let me try to start up my ch my stream chat. I'll first try to grab the current live stream. Live crafter get current stream. Hindering debugger. Okay, void function nil. Get access token. Did I not ev eval this whole buffer already? Come on now. Okay, I must have not loaded my keys file correctly. I've, I've got my keys in a separate file so that I don't um, accidentally show them on the stream. And apparently it's just not working well at the moment. Eval, okay, let me just eval this buffer, whatever. Okay, so maybe I'll try it again. Okay, I broke something. Void function, get access token, get access token, live crafter access token funk. Ah, I think that's what happened. Okay, let me do this real quick. So set queue, live crafter. Yeah, you can't see what I'm doing right now because I'm on a different screen. Access token funk is equal to... Oh, that's... What? Oh, I haven't authenticated yet. That's why. That explains it. Okay, so that should have kicked off a browser whenever this decides to load up. I think it probably loaded the wrong one, actually. Anyway, probably won't be able to show this today because I needed to do a little bit of work on it to make it work correctly. So for now, let's just call it uh, a failed demo once again. But next week it's going to work because I've, I'm basically at the point now where everything will work whenever um, I've got the authentication, everything dialed in correctly. So that's been a little bit of a like basically getting the whole flow down where you can log in smoothly, pick the right YouTube account, then start uh, making requests to the API and like grab the current live stream, etc. It's it's, you know, it's, it's always, writing the initial code is easy. Like when you just write the functions that do the things you need to do, but then making, making it work end to end is always the harder part. Jeff says, why don't you put your tokens in pass or auth info? Yeah, I will do that. It's just that I'm using different testing accounts right now for uh, storing or for authenticating and for using API keys and whatnot because I'm hitting these quota issues. So I've just got things stored in the Emacs list file for the moment, but then I'm gonna move it to a more uh, secure way to store them in, in when, once I'm a little bit further along. Okay, so let's move back to the slides here. What we're going to do is talk about Magic 3.0. And like I said, I've not prepared sufficiently for this. So we're going to see how it goes. But um, what I'll do is try to pull up the Magic.vc. I think it's the page. Let's drop this back over on the main screen. So let's see. Is there like a news? Yeah, there's the news. 3.0 released. That's the release notes and the announcement. So for those of you who don't know what Magit is, Magit is a... Probably should have just done it directly on that screen. Magit is probably the, the best Git interface I've ever used. It's a package in Emacs that makes it very easy to interact with your Git repositories and you know do pretty much any operation you would want to do with a Git repository from you know creating branches, making commits, pushing and pulling to remotes, uh, and even doing things like rebasing, uh, using the ref log, cherry picking, anything that you need to do that might be um, advanced Git operations. I'm going to be making a series of videos. I've actually started making a series of videos, but I haven't posted them yet because I'm trying to record them in advance for my uh, the time that I'll be out of the country. But if you've used it before, you know it's great. And the there was a big release this week for the 3.0 version of Magit. So what I wanted to do today is just try to take a look at it and see what things we can learn <laughs> uh, about it. You know, what, what new functionality is there for those of you who are using it already. And maybe so that those of you who don't use it might learn a thing or two about it. Tori says, hooray for the pronunciation of Magit like Magit, not like Maggot. Yeah. Somebody sent me on the wrong path on that on the first live stream that I did about Magit. 
they told me I was pr pronouncing it maggot and they said you're supposed to pronounce it like maggot. So this is why uh, I've been doing it wrong all this time. I mean, admittedly, the name does not really make it clear how you're supposed to say it. The website says how to say it, but uh, it's not obvious from reading it. So let's see. A little bit of intro there. So what I wonder is, is it possible that we've all been using Magit 3.0 all along, or if, has this been work, uh, been developed in a branch? And maybe we, maybe we've already been using this functionality, but we're going to find out soon. So what they're saying here, what uh, Jonas is saying here, is that uh, that uh, Magit uses the transient package now, uh, which is basically the, we'll show it in a minute, but transient is the user interface that uh, Magit uses for commands. So whenever you start like the commit command or the push command, it will give you a panel at the bottom of the screen that um, shows you the ways to customize the command before you run it or maybe sub commands to run. So <laughs> as people are trying to, to troll me in the chat about how to say Magit here. So uh, transient package was actually part of Magit to begin with, but I think it was split out so it could be used for other packages. And now it actually has been brought into Emacs uh, 28, I think. It's been merged into Emacs 28 as something built in, which is kind of nice because I think it's a pretty effective interface for sending parameters to commands that are going to be run. And any package can now take advantage of that, which is pretty pretty nice. Um, also, M Magit section is a, another part of Magit that's been broken out into a separate package. And uh, I will show you what that looks like as well. But, but basically, it's the way that you have collapsible sections in a custom view in Emacs. And it's very effective for Magit because there's a few different things there that you want to be able to, to expand and collapse based on you know, what context you need or what operation you're trying to do in the status buffer. And I think even other buffers as well. So if you want to uh, make a UI that's like Magit, you should check out the transient and Magit section packages. Um, Forge, the uh, the other sort of sister package to Magit, which uh, provides you with the capability of talking to GitHub, GitLab, etc. Uh, also had a new update, but I haven't actually... I don't know what's new about that, so we might take a look at that as well. Uh, one thing I thought was funny about this uh, post is that uh, Jonas didn't know that um, there was a convention for repositories where the origin is your personal fork of a repository, and then the there was a remote called Upstream, which is the real uh, original repository. Uh, so apparently Magit was never really respecting this before in the past, but now apparently it has that uh, functionality. So... It should be able to do the right thing without configuration, which is great because I've always had to set my remotes in Magit whenever I'm trying to push or pull, but maybe it will just figure it out by default if you've already got your remote names set up correctly in your Git repository that you're using, which is pretty good. So let's see, what, what's everybody been saying here? Hey, Bash Script. Uh, Jeff says, mugs for sale yet? That's something I need to do, and I just never get back around to it. I, I haven't picked the right site to do it with yet, and that's the reason why it's, it's sort of delayed. But uh, I'll let you know as soon as that happens. Matthew says, uh, this is basically TIG, but, oh, Git, but inside e Emacs, and without a single command, type that manually. Yeah, <clears throat> that's sort of the, the big thing about it. Um, if you are a Git power user, you've probably been just using the command line for everything because it's, you know... A lot of things are doable in the command line, and most user interfaces for Git don't allow you to do things like rebase very easily. Um, so you've gotten used to the command line, but then if you try Magit and you start using it to the point where you get really comfortable with it, you can do things so fast that you never want to use a command line again. And I basically don't. Like, I'll clone from the command line, but I won't change branches. Well, I'll rarely change branches, but I definitely won't rebase from the command line anymore, and I definitely won't commit from the command line anymore. Osloy says, I'm a fan of maggot pronunciation. Well, you, you can say it. You can say it however you want, I think. Um, let's see. Osloy says, is it dislike of this because you mag maggots are gross? Yeah, it makes it sound like you're, you're saying maggot as a bad thing. And I guess people don't want to use something that sounds disgusting. Ah, Matthew says, no, I meant TIG. It's an incurses based git suite. I have not used that before. Tori says, yeah, I can't quite explain to non emacsers that it's great because of the same name for festering larva. Yeah. 
Uh, Echo says, get Cherry Pick Cries in Command Line. You know, honestly, Cherry Pick is one thing that is easier to do in the command line at first whenever you use Maggot because, sorry, Maggot. See, you've already got my brain mixed up. Uh, it's not as obvious at first the right way to do cherry pick. And when I go through the videos on Magit, I'm gonna show how to do it correctly because I could never figure it out the right way um, for a while, but now I now I know how to do it right. Um, GK Suda says, would love it if Magit had a clone function. I think it does. Yeah, there's a, there's a clone function and it will ask you what the repository, uh, URL name, path, or local URL. So you can do that, I just don't do it. Juanito says, what's the difference between transient and which key? Both of them shows the available key bindings. I prefer transient UI though. So um, transient and which key are very different. Uh, which key is meant to display the key bindings under a particular prefix and transient is meant to display um, subcommands and configuration parameters for some command in Emacs. So there's a different use case for both of those. Which key is great for uh, like, for instance, if I were to hit, excuse me, hit control C, it tells me all the bindings for what's under control C, but you wouldn't do that with transient. I don't think that's, that's uh, what you would use that for. Uh, Jeff says magic, like magic. The logo is a magician's hat. Yeah, that's, that's probably the right clue, um, to know that it's supposed to be magic and not maggot. So Drishal says, does EXWM work with the native comp PGTK? No, I've tried it. Um, the reason why is because PG. PGTK is meant to be used with Wayland, and um, it doesn't use any of the XORG, X11, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't use any of those APIs. So uh, by default, that means that um, you can't even really boot into it in X. Well, I guess you could. You could. It's a GTK app. I'm guessing you could launch it, but you definitely can't use it with EXWM, mainly because um, uh, it, EXWM needs to be interacting with X windows or X org windows. Somebody tell me the right way to call that because I keep getting yelled at for saying the wrong thing. Um, somebody, it, it, EXWM needs to have X org or X 11, X 86 um, and PGTK is a different thing entirely. So they, they're not compatible. I tried it. It didn't work. Arun says GIF or GIF. Yeah, that's always the, the way to go, right? For me, it's GIF. Uh, Tomas says, having toggles is the major difference in transient compared to some key map. Yes, exactly. That, that's a very important thing in uh, the Magit interface, in my opinion, especially when you're doing things like pushing and then you want to like force push. You can just, you know, do capital P, P dash F, and then the, the letter for the remote that you want to push to. And uh, it's super fast. Matthew says, you can make transient maps for basically anything. Which key, on the other hand, does it sing for the pending key binding sequences specifically? Yep. Exactly. Tomas so says, GIF because graphics interchange format. Yeah, that's probably the right way to say it. But, you know, GIF, you know, you get used to saying it the wrong way. And then it sort of becomes a thing that uh, becomes part of your identity. So I'll just keep saying GIF, especially if it annoys people. I won't say maggot because I don't want to disrespect... Uh, the maintainers of Magit by saying the wrong thing. All right, uh, back to the, the release notes here. So likewise, Magit no, lo no longer assumes that the main branch is named master. Without any user configuration, Magit tries main, master, trunk, and development in that order uh, and uses the first one that exists in the current repository. So as you might be aware, um, there's been an effort to try to change what the default branch name is for Git repositories uh, from master to main. And GitHub has done that. I think other source control hosts have done that. So Maggot, see? Magit is now responding to that new convention so that if you clone a repository that uses main as a default, uh, the default branch, then Magit will work correctly out of the box. Kevin says Magit. Yeah, that's how I used to pronounce it and I was corrected. I believe on the main website, it will tell you that uh, exact thing. So let me just go to the about page. Come on now. Oh, this is not gonna scroll. Okay, so let's see. I went to the about page. Why doesn't, oh, okay, there we go. KG, there it is. Hey, Benoit. Git bash on Windows now asks you if the default should be main. Yep. 
Uh, Vlad says, I'm installing Geeks on a laptop using my ISO. Amazing that everything works. Oh, um, thanks for letting me know. I'm glad that someone's tried it and it actually has worked. See ya, Eric. Thanks for coming. All right. So, where is that pronunciation? I think it was in the manual somewhere. All right, so let's check that out. Manual. I'm about to, to put this issue to rest once and for all. Uh, Kevin, I kind of agree with you. Um, if, if people can't figure out how to pronounce your name, then you're going to have issues, especially if it can be pronounced in a way that doesn't sound very good. Where did I find that? Somewhere. Pronounce. There it is. How to pronounce maggot. Maggot. Okay, so either, either maggot or maggot is fine. The slogan is it's maggot. So it used to say... Okay, I think this must have been updated recently. Yeah, so previously I think that it was it was res reserving the pronunciation of mugget or mugget for German speakers, but now I think it says you can choose to use a former pronunciation just because you like it better. So I can call it mugget if I want to, and so can you, Kevin. Uh, let's see. Avocadora says, "Where is the mentioned ISO? Have you released a video on it yet?" No, I haven't yet. Uh, but the link, I put it in the chat a little bit above. Where is it? Right here. If it lets me copy it without all the extra. Yeah. I hate those redirects. Jeez. I don't even know if I still have that uh, page open. There it is. Okay. There you go, Avocadoras. So uh, let's see, GK Suda says, I removed evil, evil collections and didn't notice how much change in workflow, mostly only used evil for WQ. One weird thing is my general config broke. Oh yeah, general, I mean, it doesn't really depend on evil, but it is sort of, you know, made to hook into evil. So it might cause issues with that. Yeah, Anders, I'm looking at it right now. So um, let's go back to the release notes then. So that was everything, I think, at the end of this list. But there is a more complete release notes file. And let's take a look at it really quickly to see if there's anything else that is um, new. So there's a lot more stuff mentioned here. And we're definitely not going to read this line for line. I'm going to just try to scan through and see if there's anything that jumps out at me. I meant to do this before the stream, but I didn't have tr uh, time this morning because I overslept and had to pre prepare other things. Let's see. Drop support for Git 2.0 uh, Git 2 and 2.1. Okay. I think everybody's using much higher versions than that anyway. Let's see. Uh, okay. So previously it was called Ma uh, Magic Pop-Up, but now it's called Transient. That's what that package is. There used to be commands for pull requests inside of Magic, but now they're using Forge for that instead. Control-C, Control-E is no longer bound to dispatch pop-up. It's now bound to edit thing. Well, I guess that kind of makes sense. Uh, so that Forge can add section-specific bindings using this key. That's kind of interesting. Magic Dispatch pop-up has been renamed to Magic Dispatch and continues to be available on H, uh, question mark, and CC. Control-C, Control-B is no longer bound to browse thing. Um... Yeah, if, you should definitely take a close look at this list if you use some of these key bindings just in case your um, your workflow is going to be impacted by it. A few of these things I don't actually use myself. I just basically go to Magic Status all day long and then um, go to the things I need to go to from there. All of a sudden, this light that I have behind the camera is really starting to blind me. Uh, Magic Display... File buffer function was removed. Uh, hmm. Did I use that? I was using something in my config to... Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, magic display buffer function. So it's probably still there. I don't have magic 3 set up in my config because for some reason Geeks give me trouble to update to uh, the latest versions of all my Emacs packages, but... I'll show it in the Emacs from scratch config in a little bit. Magit refresh arguments, blah, blah, blah. Um, now supports three global key bindings. Oh, thanks, yeah. This, uh, the, the mug people are referring to is this one. 
I, I want to make these available to people, but I just haven't done it yet. Uh, Magic no longer depends on async byte comp to avoid a certain class of mystery bugs because this effort backfired. That's interesting. I uh, okay, maybe, maybe async byte comp was some new thing that was going to happen in Emacs and it didn't happen after all. Will we'll get commit mode is no longer auto loaded. Ah, uh, yeah, so Echo says, I didn't know you can do PR and review in Magit. Always learning something new. Yeah, Forge gives you the ability to do a lot of stuff. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what is what is new in Forge because um, the last time I tried to use Forge, there was things I really wanted to do with it that I wasn't able to, like get a really nice view of my notifications. It does have a way to see notifications, but I just felt like that view was very underpowered compared to what it could be. So I'm hoping there's been some improvements to that over time. If, if there hasn't been, I'm going to write my own package because um, I hate having to have a browser tab open to look at my uh, my notifications. And I know that I can get them all in email, but then it just starts getting insane with all the emails that come in all day long. Version column now shows when a repository is dirty. Um, magic log merged. Yeah, I don't know what all that's about. Refine, ignore white space, diff paint white space lines. It controls what kind of lines, white space errors are highlighted. What is what section is this? Changes since 290. Oh, okay, so there's probably new stuff that has come out since uh, 290. Show white space errors only in uncommitted changes. Commands, uh, magic commit, instant fix up, instant squash, blah, blah, blah. Unconditionally preserve empty commits that were already present before the auto squash. What does that mean? Nova says that uh, that the, the Emacs from Scratch videos helped to get Emacs set up nicely, but still they couldn't leave NeoVim. Well, that's fine. I mean, everybody has their tool of choice. Uh, it totally makes sense. Appreciate that. So what does this mean? Uh, now unconditionally preserve empty commits that were already present before the auto squash rebase performed by these commits. So I guess there's empty commits that no longer have any content because of things that have been squashed before it or something. I don't even know what that means. Rebase remove commit now supports removing the head commit. Okay, that's good. So these commands actually never have used them directly before so i don't know um what context they would get launched man work tree checkout now also offers tags and remote branches that's cool uh that's one thing i've not used uh before in magit is work trees uh, that's a pretty useful feature of git um, if you want to have multiple copies of the same repo locally but you don't want to have to clone them twice and have all the history of both of them twice there's something called a work tree that you can use to create another folder off of a different branch or a tag or even a commit and uh, you'll have a separate independent repo that shares the same history as the um, the original clone that you have but you can still treat it like a normal repository which is pretty cool Made magic tag release more flexible and added a suffix of magic tag. Magic unstaged files can now unstage files that were staged using intent to add. I don't even know what that means, but I guess it's if you've done it at the command line with this intent to add parameter, then maybe you need to be able to unstage them. So maybe that's a special thing that you don't really hit unless you have a problem with it. Okay. Magic Cherry is now available from the Magic Dispatch prefix. That seems new because I don't think that there was always an apply command, but there wasn't one for cherries. No, there was there. Maybe there was one. Here, let's let's find out. I'm gonna. Here's what we'll do. I'm gonna open up uh, Magic here in my current Emacs configuration and see what we see inside of it. Why is it not? allowing me to let's see let's go to my emacs.org file i'll open up my magic status buffer 
Uh, maybe I'll also turn on, um, f uh, what's it called? Keycast. Keycast mode so you can see my keys. Okay. So if I do question mark here, um, there is a cherries action, but I actually never use that. I, I use something else instead because this one never makes sense to me on how you're supposed to use it. That's just my problem. I don't know if it's a... Whoa, what's going on? Why have I got so much CPU usage all of a sudden? wonder if it's uh, compiling things in the background. Let's see. Async. Oh, yeah. Doing something here. Here we go. We're compiling everything right now, it seems. So, apparently, my config is using uh, Magic 290. And I think what happened here is that I uh, deleted the uh, ELN cache folder before I started the stream because I had a problem with it. Ashraz, you made it. Uh, and now it's trying to recompile everything. So if you see the stream get really jerky, then that's why. Hopefully it doesn't impact the quality of the stream, though. Uh, Ozloy says, I'm used to watching on 2.5 speed. How can you understand anything that I say if you're watching on 2.5 speed? Because I I speak a little bit fast, so probably you're going to uh, like hear me speaking like a chipmunk at, at that speed. Okay, cool. It, it finished compilation. Um... Appenzell says, this may be a bit off topic, but have you considered bridging the Discord server with Matrix? Mm, I had been considering Matrix a little bit, but um, I'm sort of changing my mind on it because um, hosting a Matrix server or you, even using Matrix.org uh, is not ideal. So I'm actually considering uh, other options, uh, IRC being one of them. So... Uh, if you know, well, here's a digression. We'll talk about this for a second. Hey, Simon. We'll talk about this for a second because maybe some of you don't know about it. So um, over the last couple of weeks, actually, it's been ongoing for a while, but it only just came to a head over the last, you know what? Let me let me do this in a different browser so that we don't, we don't get blinded by this. Uh, cute browser. Uh, Avocadora says that Matrix is hard to use, to be fair. Yeah, it's a little bit weird, to be honest. Okay, so um, there's been a controversy in the uh, free and open source software community over the last couple of weeks where um, there has been someone who purchased the Freenode IRC network, and they said originally that they weren't going to ex ex uh, exercise any control over the network and they had been owning it for a while without actually exercising any control over the network but maybe over the last two weeks they actually did start making demands on the staff basically trying to take control over the the network to have full you know operator control basically and a as a result of that many of the free node staff members left and started their own irc network called libra chat this is what you see right here on the screen libra.chat so uh, many, many free and open source projects that had chat rooms on Freenode have now moved over to Libra chat. So why do I mention this? Well, because of this, because it sort of happened right now and because I've been thinking about um, the sort of future of where the System Crafters community hangs out for chat, uh, I've been considering for a while getting off of Discord just because, um, you know, it's a proprietary app. Also, it's an Electron app. You know, it's it takes up a lot of CPU I would prefer to be using my chat through Emacs and not through some other application, but you can't really do that with Discord because there's not a good Discord client for Emacs and uh, it's not really a, it's not friendly to IRC anymore as it used to be. So um, I am experimenting with having a System Crafters channel on Libra chat. I'm not going to shut down the, the System Crafters Discord by any means. I'm going to keep that open. But if you want to use IRC instead and you want to talk to people uh, in the System Crafters community, you can go to the Libra chat server and join the System Crafters channel. Um, probably I'm not in the channel right now because I'm not connected to IRC, but um, other people that you see around the Discord may show up there. If you want to use IRC instead, definitely check it out. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's something I've been thinking about. And this is an, an opportunity to hang out there on this IRC network because there's a lot of cool projects there. You know, Emacs, Geeks, um, Source Hut, many other projects that we've talked about on this channel have channel, sorry, yeah, on this YouTube channel, they have IRC channels on LibreChat. And I kind of feel like it's better to be 
in a larger server that has official channels for different projects because you can actually go there and be a part of those channels as well as talk to people from the system crafters community uh, i haven't been able to, to spend time in the emacs channel or geeks channel on free node because i don't want to have too many chats i have to monitor but if i'm on irc primarily and on the same server as those channels then um I might actually, you know, gain some benefit from listening in on those channels to see if there's any news that are ha things that are happening there, or maybe like, you know, get some tips about Emacs or Geeks, etc. So um, I want to try it out. Uh, Benoit is there. I know that uh, Felipe also showed up this morning. Uh, Matto was there. Uh, I haven't been back in, so I don't know if anybody else joined. But if you want to check it out, definitely check that out. Let's see what else. Uh, Tori says, are you using Doom Mode Line? Uh, I asked because my telephone mode line doesn't have a slot for keycast yet. Um, Doom Mode Line doesn't either. I had to do something special for that. Uh, but yeah, I am using Doom Mode Line. So keycast. So basically in my config, I have a keycast set up. And I think I took this from the keycast repo, like a, like a, a, a comment on an issue there. And basically you just define a, an inline minor mode. And you can just uh, run that as a minor mode. And then it will add the uh, key cast thing to the global mode string. So that's how it's been working for me so far. Uh, Avocadora says, could you make a video on how to set up IRC on Emacs? The manual on ERC is hard to understand. Yeah, I definitely want to do that because if I'm going to be encouraging people to use IRC to check out the System Crafters community, then I'm going to have to explain how to set that up, right? Osloy, yes, it is the, the hash System Crafters channel. Tomas asked a great question. How do you deal with chat history on IRC? Well, um, it doesn't have a history by default. If you were to disconnect from a server and then reconnect, then you lose whatever was said in between those two times that you were there. So the way that most people deal with this is by using something called an IRC bouncer. And uh, the most common one that people use is something called ZNC. Uh, ZNC is, uh, here we go. ZNC is uh, basically a program that you run, maybe on a server somewhere, maybe on your local machine, whatever, um, that will connect to the IRC server on your behalf. And then you connect your IRC client to ZNC instead of the IRC server. And what ZNC does just stays connected and it keeps all the history of the chat in the IRC channels that you're on, maybe any messages you've received. And then when you reconnect to the ZNC server using your IRC client, you get all that history. Um, so using a bouncer is basically the, um, the best way to do that. There's, I think there's free ZNC instances out there, but personally, I don't necessarily trust a free instance because it could be anybody there just looks, listening into your chats. Um, there also is a service called IRC cloud that, um, is a paid service that will allow you to do something like bouncing functionality and they have uh, mobile apps. Um, I eventually would like to provide some kind of, um, IRC bouncing service to people if they wanted to use it, but uh, that's another thing that has to be done in my free time. Let's see. Nova says, I know for Matrix there is a bridge system for IRC to Matrix. Is there a bridge for Discord to IRC? Um, I think so, but Discord does not like third-party clients, and I think they're becoming, well, I don't know if they're becoming more hostile, but they I think they ultimately don't want people making third-party clients anymore. So uh, there, I think there was an official Discord bridge at some point, and then they removed it, if I'm remember, remembering correctly. So I, I would just assume that you probably shouldn't tr depend on an IRC bridge for Discord. Uh, why not Jabber, Anders asks. Uh, this is a good question. Jabber is a more advanced protocol, um, but... The thing I see as a benefit of IRC in this case is that you can be on a network where a lot of other people already are. Like a lot of people who are very smart and working on very important free and open source software projects are already on LibreChat using IRC. And uh, I feel like there's some benefits to that if you want to get involved with those projects or uh, learn some things for people who aren't necessarily watching this channel. You know, there's many, many people on that server already. So I'm starting to see the value of being in a place where you can find other people aside from just the people who are in this community. Now, you know, obviously 
I could try to hoard people and, and keep my own isolated place like on the Discord, but I don't think that's necessarily the right thing for everyone. That, that said, I'm not getting rid of the Discord anytime soon. Whoa. Thank you. Let's not do that right now. Uh, let's see. Um, Tomas says, it doesn't sound much better than IRSSI in screen. Well, that is another way to do it. If you want to use um, a terminal-based chat client like IRSSI, if you SSH into a server that you have somewhere and you connect to IRC using IRSSI and you set it up using GNU screen or, or Tmux or anything like that, you could SSH into that server from anywhere and then use your chat. However, that requires that you use SSH to get to your chat. And it's not really good if you want to use like a mobile client or something. I mean, you could do SSH on your mobile, but I don't really know if it's going to be a great experience. Uh, Pamper says, IRC would be nice. I've, I like to follow discussion, but I don't like modern uh, chats like Discord. Yeah, I just don't like the fact that I can't use it inside of, uh, inside of Emacs. I would much prefer to use things in Emacs. Benoit says you can also use IRSSI with ZNC. Yeah, definitely you can. I also think there is a ZNC module for ERC in Emacs. Let's see. Uh, e e uh, Emacs, uh, ZNC, sorry. ERC, ZNC. Gotta love all these uh, acronyms. Okay, so there's ZNC.EL. I haven't tried this yet. And uh, it seems to be, be getting updated, which is good. So if you load this package, then you should be able to connect to a ZNC server. Tomas says, how would you connect to ZNC if not SSH? Um, it, you, it has its own port that's open. I mean, you could tunnel that through SSH, but I think that it um, it's, it's its own server. What mobile client would you use for IRC? There are clients on mobile that can connect to ZNC or IRC servers. Uh, yeah, Ander says uh, eJabber or eJabberG. Yeah, that's a good server, I think. I, I might run one of those at some point as well, but um, we'll see. I've got some ideas for a service that I would like to provide to people for things like email, uh, XMPP, uh, IRC bouncing, that kind of stuff. But that's like, I don't have time for that right now. <laughs> so uh, it won't happen anytime soon, but maybe later. Corel says, I'm fond of leaving WeChat running and connecting to it with Emacs or a mobile client. Yeah, WeChat is also another option that is, it's an IRC client that has like a bouncer built in. So you can connect to that client from another WeChat client. And there is a WeChat client on uh, Android that I know of. Benoit says, eJeopardy is built with Erlang. Yes, it is. As far as I remember too. Oh, this microphone. Sorry for that, people. I know it's probably deafening you right now. Okay, better now. So when I was messing with my streaming setup, I changed cables and I think I, I moved back to the cable that's uh, got a short in it. So that's where, the reason why it's, it's uh, yelling today. Okay, we got way off topic here. We were talking about Magit before and then I started talking about IRC. So that's sort of how it goes, I guess. Let's see here. Um, so yeah, this is 2.90 of Magit that we're looking at here. I don't really know if 3.0 is gonna look very different. The only thing that might be different is the commands that are available in Dispatch. So we might be able to look at those uh, next to each other to see if there's any difference. So what I'm going to do is try to load up um, the Emacs from scratch configuration. Um, Anakit says, most IRC channels have logs, at least GNU channels. Yeah, that's true. You can find logs in places, which can be useful. Um, but you, a channel has to opt into that, I think. Uh, Emacs from scratch. And then uh, run. Come on now. Yeah, the, the, the command line completions here aren't going very well. Let's see, Corfu. Why is Corfu not working? Phew, that's not even working. Anyway, run emacs.sh. Man, it's working really well today, emacs.sh. 23 unstaged, yeah, that's my dot .files folder. So I don't, I don't, commit things very often and I often stage hunks of those so um whoa
Sorry, hopefully it will load the theme in a second and stop blinding you. Uh, here we go again. Yeah, I forgot to set the right uh, setting for this before I started this up. All right, let me do something really quick. I have to remember what the setting is to keep... Uh... Huh. Oh, okay. That's actually the right thing to do. Hmm, okay. Let's try that one more time. Seven people on the IRC channel. Well, it sounds like I need to join up. Let's see. Uh, ERC. Once again, all my CPU is being taken up by native comp. Hopefully it's getting there. ERC TLS, whoops. Hey Felipe. Hey Alex. Yeah, this is taking forever. All right, let me go to uh, System Crafters channel. Here we are. So uh, those of you who haven't seen ERC before, this is what it looks like. It's basically an Emacs buffer where you just have the ability to uh, to chat uh, inside of Emacs and um, all the messages from people who are typing are just showing up in the buffer. You can type in the buffer. Uh, you can do things like, you know, if you have evil mode you, in any key bindings, I think you can just, you know, select text and copy it. Um, it's it's very nice interface in my opinion. There's there's ERC. There's also um, RC IRC that's built into Emacs. ERC and RC IRC are both built in. There's also Circe C I R C E, which is another client that's pretty good. So you have your pick of IRC clients, and ERC is the one that over time I found that um, was featureful enough and looked nice enough that I liked it. But I have used RC IRC, RC IRC. <laughs> And Cersei, I've used all three of them basically over time. Uh, Balby says, I need to pick your .emx again to get some of your nice ERC colors. Yeah, that's just like um, one of these modules. Benoit says, open standards are the best. Yeah, it's... One thing I like about the IRC, being on IRC is that it's much easier um, for clients like Emacs to use it because it's just an open protocol and you can connect to it however you want. Let's see, let me look up my configuration really quick and I can tell you what the, the colors are. So, ERC, whoops, that's the wrong one. ERC, ERC, no. Chat, there we are. It is called, H, no, it is, well, there's HL Nix, but there's also, which is the one for the colorization of names? Maybe it is HL Nix. Um, there's a, a module, basically. There's a set of modules you can turn on to add certain functionality, and HL Nix is one of them. I think that's the one that causes people's names to be colorized differently. Uh, and it makes uh, makes it possible for you to um, track people's names more easily. Like, if I wanted to say, uh, hey, to Benoit. So, uh, hey. Yeah, there we go. Then you see that Benoit's name gets uh, highlighted, and you can even click on it. Um, and, and get, you know, commands for the person's name, etc. So, kind of cool. Uh, Nova says you can also make IRC bots. Yeah, you could definitely make an IRC bot with um, with ERC. So, pretty cool um, IRC client. I definitely recommend it if you uh, want to try IRC and you want to use Emacs to do it. But it does take some uh, configuration to... Oh, this thing is still going. What is the deal here? All right, so let's see. 
Speaking of Native Comp, anyone here to care to share their experience with it? I'm considering switching over to, from 27. For me, Native Comp has worked very well, but as you can see, uh, whenever it needs to recompile your uh, your packages to native code, it will eat up all of your CPU. As you can see, my CPU reading is off the charts right now, and it's slowing down the stream pretty heavily. Amles says, ERC versus Cersei. Um, I haven't used Cersei in a while, but both of them are good. I feel I felt like Cersei was a little bit more minimal, but um, yeah, they're all good. I, I would say if you want to use IRC in Emacs, try all of them and see which one you like. I liked I, RC IRC at some point as well because it is also pretty minimal. So uh, they all have their benefits. Uh, Alex says, "Is it free node?" This is uh, Libra Chat. Hyperveen. Uh, try Telegad El as a Telegram client for Emacs. Yes, I use Telegram every day. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Sebastian, you were asking about native comp. It is uh, it is definitely fast enough, or is faster enough that you should definitely try it. Oh boy, now I'm getting errors about that directory because I I faked it. Okay. Uh, Corafig says, uh, I, I would prefer this chat over YouTube chat in screencast. Yeah, well, this is what I'm basically trying to do is I'm trying to make the... Nova, yes, I, I'm definitely going to do that. Um, so anyway, I'm trying to make an IRC-like interface for the YouTube live chat in Emacs. That's basically what I'm trying to do with this uh, project I was talking about earlier. So it's nice to see some people joining up in the chat here. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around and and, uh, and join us there. But uh, for those of you who aren't in IRC yet, uh, the Discord is still there. We're still going to be talking uh, on there as well. This thing is taking forever, man. I mean, like, we're trying to look at the new features of Magit, and uh, it's just eating the stream until then. But the nice thing is that the, well, I probably shouldn't say it, uh, let's let's knock on wood somewhere, uh, but the, the camera hasn't frozen yet, so I'd say that's a good sign. Praveen, unfortunately, I cannot speak Hindi. <laughs> Sebastian says, I guess I'm in for a building Emacs from Source Adventure. Wish me luck. Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. It works pretty well. Um, Depending on which Linux distribution you use, if you use Linux, uh, you may have the ability to use a package. Uh. Oh, so it's really that easy? You can just join Libra Cloak and say cloak me and it works? That's awesome. So join uh, Libra Cloak and then say cloak me. Thanks for kicking me out, bot. Uh, it basically makes it so that your your who is information isn't shown on your user uh, to keep people from seeing what your actual IP address and host name are, so they can't harass you. Basically, um, I think it's a useful thing. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm cloaked technically speaking, but I guess I can still see information. But uh, when you join and leave, I think that's sort of the way that um, that's the way that it works. They they show that stuff there. <laughs> I think after cloaking, the bot bans you from the channel. Well, that'd be pretty funny. It masks your virtual host mask. Uh, they can still attain it, but everyone does it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's better. It's just a you know first line protection from having people mess with you. Uh, another thing is that um, if you use a a bounce server, then if you connect to your bounce server and your bounce server is connected to the IRC server, then the they see the address of the bounce server rather than your personal address. That's another reason that using bounce is, is better. <laughs> Praveen says, I don't understand what you're doing in this video. That's okay. Okay, so 
Uh, Rudislav says that uh, he's working on a Telegram bot in Emacs that opens automation possibilities. Yeah, it's kind of a cool thing, actually. Are you going to keep complaining about this folder that doesn't exist? Let me get rid of this thing and uh, fix that, actually. Let's see. Run Emacs. I think that I want... Let's see. Run current system. Uh, was a profile share Emacs. So there's no 28. I swear I saw one somewhere. Okay, so 27.2 we'll put here. Maybe that'll make it happier in the short term. But it's not 27.2 though, so who knows if it's going to cause any real problems. Try it one more time. Oh, interesting. I've seen this problem before. Huh. So this is what this error, this you probably can't see it. Unknown specializer byte to native funk def. I, I see this every time I try to update um, Emacs now, and I don't know why it happens. Huh. That's really interesting. Now that I've seen it again, I might be able to do something about it. So I'm just going to take this out. Sorry, folks. Let me just get this running, and then we'll get back to uh, playing around with the new Magit. Okay, so I'm going to try to run Magit status and see if it works. Toggle input. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Bavesh says, I've tried almost all IDEs for Python, but majorly are taking too much memory. Just want to know how much memory Emacs takes. Is it good for web, web development? Um, Emacs can take uh, a, a large amount of memory depending on what you're doing with it, but it's, you know, it's garbage collected, so it will get, uh, it will go away after a while. But the, um, the problem with using Emacs as a Python IDE is that you have to figure out um, the right language server to set up. And if you watch the video that I have about um, setting up a py Python development configuration in Emacs, the language server I use in that video is not very good, or at least it's um, pretty slow on larger projects. And I don't know if I can really recommend it. So uh, there's other ones that are out there that are better now, but I haven't tried them yet. So I don't really have an opinion on them yet. All right, so let me pull up uh, magic status. Oh, yeah. what? Okay, so forge, yeah, whatever. Okay, so, so far, all looks the same. If I look here, so far I don't see anything different. Um, what about if I hit P for push? Yeah, nothing really different at the moment, but I need to make sure that I'm, I'm using the version that I expect to be using, so... Let's take a look at the source file for magic status. I'm gonna jump to magicstatus.el and let me see what folder we're in. 2021.05.28, so that could be the latest. Uh, Luis says, uh, the, the Python language server I was using in that video, PyLS, is deprecated. Yeah, I'm not surprised about that. So I think we're using three, but so far there's no real, real um, obvious change that I've seen. What about rebase? Let's see, rebase interactively. Um, I'm not gonna actually do this, but it, let's just try it. Yeah, sure, why not? Yep, I need to stash changes. I'm playing with fire here. Okay, so nothing really different here as far as I can tell. I see some highlights here that I didn't see before though. I don't know if that's new or if I'm just imagining it. All right, I'm gonna back out of that. So let's pull back up the, oops, I need to go Let's click here. So cube browser. Um, we can go back to the release notes on that. 
Oh, okay. I don't want to look at it in that uh, view. Posts. Actually, I do want to look at the forge update, but I'll look at that in a second. Let's go to the GitHub rendering of this. Whoops. What did I just do? Okay. Toggle buffer lock. Magic find file. Uh, oh, hmm. Magic find file is now available from Magic file dispatch. So there's some functions that I haven't actually um, used very much. Wait, is there two Emacs instances open? That would be weird. So let's say mm, Magit file dispatch. In fact, we probably should go to an, uh, an actual file that is in source control before I do that. And I'll go and uh, pop that stash because I need those changes back. So we'll go back to emacs.org and then Magit file dispatch. So that gives you a list of actions that you can see on um, the current file. Stage, unstage, diff, blame. So I guess they're talking about the go to file, capital V. Oh, that's weird. So maybe it works here also? No. Hmm. Strange. All right, so file dispatch. So I don't know what go to file does because it just stays in the same buffer. Previous blob. That's cool. I need, to, I need to learn some more of these commands before I start making videos on them uh, for the channel because obviously there's a lot of things I don't know how to do in Magit because I use it one way and that's the only way I use it. Basically using Magit status all day. Um, all right, let's go back to the uh, release notes again. diff buffer file, learn to visit a commit. There, there's a lot of really mm, workflow specific changes here, I think. But they're not very visible. So it's not really easy to show these changes, I think. Uh, it would be nice if uh, Jonas was here to kind of tell me some things that I could do that were visible, but I never, I, di I didn't tell him specifically to be here. I mean, obviously he's got things he's got to do. So he wouldn't come here just because I said so, but let's see. Tag release now runs git asynchronously. Well, that's nice. Branch or commit at point. Ah, oh, interesting. Magit file rename now also renames buffers that visit untracked files. That's great. So let's try that out. Um, Let's go to Emacs here, and then this file is uh, untracked. So, Magit rename. Magit file rename. I didn't know that R was there, actually. So, I'm going to rename this to uh, history old. Oh, really? Okay. Apparently, you, you it doesn't pick the file under the cursor, unfortunately. But I did just rename that, and it worked, so that's good. So, I can rename that back. Capital R, history old, name it back to history. What? Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. Just checking on the IRC really quick. Yeah, I like that there's some activity going on in here. So let's see, we'll go back to Emacs and, oh, no, I want to go back to the, to the release notes again. All right. All right, new commands, log matching branches and log matching tags. That's interesting. I'll take a look at that in a second. New command work tree move. Maybe that's a good way to go through this. Uh, commands are usually meant for user actions so if we look for all new commands we can check things out uh status here available using control c Oof, that's a weird key binding tries to go to the position in the status buffer that corresponds to the position in the current vis file visiting buffer okay let's check that out ah uh, 
Uh, Andre says, what is the key binding for, for not expand in the mini buffer? Let's see if I have something special set up for that. Um, C M J. It's like Ivy alt done. Yeah, I think, uh, there's one of the Ivy commands. This is Ivy we're using right now uh, on the, um, Emacs from scratch config. I think there's like control alt J, maybe the one that works. And it basically, if you've typed in something and you want to select what you've typed and not one of the completion candidates, I think control alt J is the one that does it. Uh, so what I was doing is to go into, I was going to use the magic status here function command. So I'm going to jump right here, let's say, and say magic status here. And then it will jump into, yeah, it didn't actually, well, it picked the right file, but it didn't jump to the hunk that represents that edit. However, maybe if I go to a line that has been changed, let's go back to the status buffer, close that out. Uh, is that right? Let's go to this line. And then magic status here. Okay, so that worked. So if I go down to the um, font changes, so set face attribute, if I use magic status here, great. I might actually change my binding for that because it's pretty helpful to be able to jump to um, the current line in the status buffer because then you can go and, and stage changes or at least look at the diff of what you've been editing uh, more directly. So that's a nice command I didn't know about. Yeah, but I guess I didn't know about it because it's new, right? New command, magic status here. Okay. Uh, setting magic status go to file position to a non nil value causes magic status status to behave the same way. So now there's a new, um, is that a new setting? So you can, you can even make magic status do the same thing by setting this magic status go to file position variable to true. New commands, magic assume unchanged. Uh, jump, oh, jump to assume unchanged. I don't really know what that means. So jump to assume unchanged. You know, I need to um, split this so that we can see both at the same time because this is getting a little bit annoying. So I'll split this frame and then pull up the uh, change log here and then the Emacs pane here. Okay. So what if I use this, um, which one was it? It seems to have scrolled and I lost what I was looking at. Skip work tree, uh, rebase break, break action. I don't know what that means. Branch spin out. Okay. I need to look at that one. Cause that might be useful. Skip work tree break. There was another command I was looking at. Assume unchanged. So what about that? Magit assume unchanged. Assume, whoa, okay. So I'm not gonna mess with that. But I think the idea there seems to be um, Magit assume unchanged. Call uh, git update index assume unchanged. So is that a way to basically tell git that the file is not really changed, even though it has been changed. It's kind of weird if, if that's the case. Um, the next thing would be log and matching branches. Magit log matching branches. Type a pattern to pass to dash dash branches. Hmm. Master. Okay. I don't know if that's really helpful, but. New command, uh, work tree move. I'm not gonna mess with that one right now. Toggle verbose refresh. Yeah, probably that's if you need to have more output from Git whenever you're uh, refreshing the status buffer, I'm guessing. Magit reset keep. Magit push notes ref. Commit absorb. Hmm, what does that mean? Magit commit absorb. Spread stage changes across recent commits. Huh. And, uh, oh, okay. So it requires a an external command called git absorb. 
That's really interesting, actually. I'm curious what that means. Uh, Tomas says, you might want to keep some files changed locally, but not seeing them all the time and get status. Yeah, that, that makes sense for sure. Git absorb is like git commit fix up, but automatic. You have a feature branch with a few commits. Teammate reviewed the branch and pointed out bugs, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you don't want to shove them into an opaque commit. Uh, instead of manually finding commit shots for a commit fix up, you can basically run git absorb. Automatically identify which commits are safe to modify and which stage changes belong to each of those commits. So I'm guessing what happens is that it sort of looks over the list of commits in your branch and looks over the list of changes that you have and finds which commits have changes to those files and just like merges them in. I mean, that would be pretty helpful, but I don't know if I would trust it entirely. However, if you want to have clean commits and you go to the trouble of trying to stage hunks of certain files and then doing fix ups to various commits, it is a little bit of a pain, but uh, Magit does make that a lot easier in my experience. Andre says fear of font can be installed by an Emacs function. Which function? See magic commit auto fix up for an alternative uh, implementation. Um, okay, so it requires a different script. So either of these require some external script or program to do uh, the same thing. So if you're interested in that kind of behavior, there's commands here that can do that. Apparently, this uh, magic commit auto fix up already existed. So this absorb command is, a, is an alternative. I think one benefit of Absorb apparently is that it's written in Rust, so maybe it's a lot faster. Magit project status. That's cool. Let me actually check that out. So this seems to just look for uh, the status buffer for the current project. No. Uh, Magit project status. Let's see what it consults for that. I would imagine it's defaulting to project.el first. Yeah, okay. Project root. So yes, it's using project.el. And if you don't know what project.el is, it's an effort to uh, provide some level of project support to Emacs built in um, as an alternative to projectile. We haven't talked about it on the channel yet, but eventually I do want to talk about it. So apparently this uh, project status does use uh, project.el. So um, project root, there's a, a function called project root that will try to grab that. Oh, it needs arguments. Okay, let's see, project root. Whoops, wrong one. Project root. Ah, well, yeah. Is this interactive? No. So how do I know what the project is? If, uh, directory name must be absolute. Okay, so project current. There we go. So maybe project current is the function. Okay, yeah, that looks right. So probably it is using that uh, magit uh, project status. Okay, so yeah. Project root project current t. So that, that's right. So basically, if you wanted a way to get to the status buffer for the current project, you could use that instead of magit status but it kind of already does that, I think. The difference would be uh, magic status is going to give you the status for the Git repository that's closest to the current file. So let's say you're in um, a nested file system structure and you have a Git repository, like maybe for a sub module that's inside of the folder of a larger project that has its own .git folder. I think magic status would give you the, the git status of the sub module, but git project status might give you the status of the overall project folder, depending on how the project detection is set up. So I don't know if that's true, but um, you could probably just assume that magic project status is what you want to use if you are trying to do git status for your actual code project rather than just whatever folder you're currently in. Okay, let's see, what else we got here? At least we're finding some things that are new, which is good. I was hoping that 
would see something that um, is new. So looking for new commands seems to be the way to do it. Uh, get commit absorb modules. What does that mean? Oops. Uh, magic commit absorb. No, that's, I'm looking at variables. Magit uh, absorb absorb. Can't type. Absorb modules. Spread modified modules across recent commits. So what does that even mean? Is that like a language specific concept? List modified modules. Okay, so there's a function for that. Magit git. Oh, is that for sub modules? Whoa. Yeah, okay. So it's lo looking at sub module status. <clears throat> Maybe this is actually for doing commits on submodules as well. Um, if you have a repository that uses submodules and you actually have to make commits to those submodules, this might actually be useful. I don't know. I didn't know there was a uh, set of functionality for this. So magit git.el. Let's check that out really quick and see what it has in it. This remotes. That's cool. So. Probably won't work here, but it would work somewhere else. Uh, also, you know, if you wanted to do some automation of your Git repository um, actions, you should check out the commands and functions that are part of uh, Magic because you might be able to use it for some things. There's a built-in uh, VC mode that has some functions for that as well, but I don't know if they're as um, polished as what's in Magic. But I've never used them, so I can't tell you for sure. So modules. Let me just look for modules. Lots of functions here. So how about mm, dash modules, list modified modules. I think I have a sub module in my dot files uh, folder. Let's see. So magit list modified modules. Yes, nil. Probably not there. Excuse me, Gilberto. I'm reaching the point of the stream where my mouth starts to uh, fail to cooperate with my brain. Osloy says, I have a file system watcher that makes a commit on every file save, and then I use tags to mark certain commits. So I use tags like uh, most people use commits. Do you use that on every repository that you have or just on like personal notes repositories? Because I think it would be very nice for your org mode files to store them in a Git repo, but it is annoying to have to make commits yourself. So it, it does make sense to automatically commit changes as you save them. Um... So yeah, that makes sense for that case, but I would never do auto commits for a code project because you kind of want to have your commits um, make logical sense, at least in my opinion. So I uh, I don't know that I would do it on a, an actual code project. I'm gonna have to go catch up on the IRC activity after I get done with the stream. Hey Enrique. Yeah, well, I haven't been able to use it yet because I've had trouble updating um, my uh, Geeks profile for Emacs. But uh, I, it, so far, it looks like everything seems to be basically the same aside from, for some additions. So hopefully it won't break me whenever I do that. Okay, so there's bug fins, fixes since 2.90. Um... Simon says, Git auto commit mode is nice and handy for personal org files. Yeah, that was definitely the one that I had been considering using for that purpose. I just never got back around to it. The thing about automatically committing Git, uh, sorry, org files in Git is that if you are using multiple computers, which I do, and you have all of them doing automatic commits to the same repo, then keeping those in sync is kind of a headache. However, one strategy that I thought of to deal with that is that each machine has its own special branch. And then I use, you know, typical Git merge and whatnot to then merge the changes back between the different machines. So uh, one of the computers could be considered the uh, primary computer and it could have master. And then uh, the other computers would have their own named branches potentially. So that's, that's how I would do it if I had that set up, but I currently don't. So, and we can keep looking at this a little bit, but um, I'm, I kind of want to look at the changes to Forge also to see if there's anything interesting there that has been added. Because Forge has a lot of um, 
a lot of potential, I think, for people who have to use Git, uh, GitHub or GitLab, etc. Osloy says auto push, auto pull, rebase. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely do that. Maybe it's. I just don't know if I want to be pushing all the time, like all day long, but maybe it's not a big deal. Osloy says if you're only working on one computer at a time, that should take care of it. Yeah, you have a point. I mean, sometimes I do use two computers at the same time. Like, let's say I have to use my work laptop and my personal laptop because I'm working on my work laptop and I'm maybe, you know, talking to somebody on a messenger on my personal laptop or something. Um, and maybe I'm taking notes on both of those. Who knows? But literally making commits at the same time is not very likely. So I guess the more often you do commits and push and, and pull, the less likely you're going to run into a problem. So it makes sense. The only other downside I think to it is that your git commit history is going to become enormous and the uh, repo may uh, get pretty heavy over time. But one way around that is probably just to do a shallow clone of the repo since you don't really need the history um, in most cases I would say. So there's probably ways to get around it. Might be interesting to make a video on a strategy for that at some point. Tomas says, let's see some code review issues PRs in Forge. Well, let's see if I can actually make it work. Um, I think I have Forge set up here, right? So Forge Dispatch. Oh, great. Oh, I don't have SQLite installed. Um, I must have SQLite installed. Come on. Ah, SQLite. Yeah, I have it there. I don't know what the problem is with um, with Forge. Let's see. Forge Dispatch, compiling Emacs SQLite binary. Um, maybe it has a problem with... Huh. Does it, what does it need? Is it need GCC or something? The path variable, in enemy of system crafters every, everywhere. Yeah, like many environment variables are, are major issues, especially whenever you start using geeks. Um, let's see. It is possible. It is possible. Tomas says maybe it's using for SQLite, not SQLite 3. Let's, well, it wants to compile something. Let me actually check that function. So um, let's just do some diagnosis. Forge. Uh, dispatch. Let's go look in forge commands. What does it do to verify that there is a thing available? So here's a transient definition from that transient package we talked about before. Forge pull. Uh, let's see. So how about uh, Emacs SQL, okay. Forge commands, this is forge commands. Let's look for Emacs, okay, SQL, no. Forge.el, Emacs SQL. Um, let's see, what is there a util? Let's actually look for functions. So forge Emacs, what? Compile. SQL, Forge SQL, Forge DB. Okay, that makes sense. So how about compile? Where is this happening? Oh, it's a separate library. That makes sense. Okay, so Emacs SQL, compile. Here we go. All right, so now... SQLite 3. Yeah, I think it looks for SQLite 3. Um, let's see. Variable SQLite. How about if I can set the path to it? Executable. Config Emacs Elpa SQLite SQLite. Reserve connection. C compilers. Executable path. Why? Wow. Huh? Okay. CC, GCC, CLang. Uh, I think I have all those installed. 
Yeah. Yeah. Let's just run it directly. Emacs SQL. Whoops. Wrong number of arguments. Okay, let's check that out one more time. So it wants a, a connection. Why? Compile S expression SQL for connection into a string. Oh. This is kind of a waste of time, but I'll give it a couple more minutes just to see if I can make it work. Yeah, you can't actually see what I'm doing here in this uh, window either because I don't have, um, what's it called, keycast set up, I think. Pretty sure I don't, yep. Um, all right, this is really annoying. No binary available aborting. Well, yeah, it hasn't been compiled yet. Can I it help? There we go. Executable. So it's under... Wow, that's the wrong folder. Why is it putting the things there? Emacs, Elpa, Emacs SQLite. Let's just uh, drop over there real quick. So... I could try that. I don't know if it's going to work, and I have to make sure I put it in the right path. Um, let's see. Config. Emacs. Elpa. Uh, Emacs SQL. Was it this one? SQLite? Okay, so it needs a compiler, obviously. Okay. So it's trying to, comp you know what, <laughs> let me just go to the folder and make it myself. How about that? So I'm going to pull up a shell and then I'm going to go to CD config Emacs, um, Elpa, right? Elpa, Emacs SQL, um, what was it? SQLite, SQLite, LS, okay, make, error. Yeah, this doesn't seem like it's going to work. There might be some other um, dependency that I'm missing somehow. Oh, this is compiling SQLite itself. That's hilarious. Why can't you just use the one that's on the system? <laughs> okay. So we'll look at the uh, release notes for Forge. I don't think we're going to waste any time trying to make this work because it's uh, it's not working today. But uh, let's check out the release notes at least to see what might be new. So let's check out the blog post for 0 0.2. Um, <sighs> Jonas didn't keep a change log. So there's a lot of improvements across the board and he didn't want to delay the release. So let me check out the... Well, there's a discussion thing here. Nobody commented. That's fine. We can go look at the commit history if we want to, to see if there's anything interesting there. Yeah, I think that's what it's doing to Moss. I think you're right. Topic label. NTFS file system. Okay. Some improvements for pull requests, it seems. Yeah. 
They've also updated some things for the upstream name. Toggle display and status buffer. There's HTML X. Oh, it's for the manual. Okay. Okay, so probably not a major amount of changes since the last time that there was a release. Of course, I don't know the last time it did get released. Okay, so there's some ability to do forks, to create forks on GitLab. That's kind of nice. Cosmetics. Let's see, what was the last time there was a release on this uh, package? 0 0.1 was oh, 2018. So it's been quite a while since the last one. However, probably people have been using this from um, Melpa anyway. So you might have been getting the latest changes if you've been updating your package through, Mel through Melpa. So that is possible. So, uh, okay. Well, no, we can't really show Forge. I might, maybe I'll try once again just to see if uh, the, well, if they're compiling SQL, SQLite 3, then obviously I need to have the right dependencies in place to make that work. There's errors in here. Error. I wonder if it's just a matter of having a different version of um, GCC than what's expected by this code. Like a lot of variable argument list issues that's funny anyway so i think that you know we've we've covered enough of what we need to see from um from bo both uh, magic and forge i think um doesn't look a whole lot different but that's good because if it was a whole lot different you would have to learn a lot of new things so hopefully the changes that are a part of this are beneficial uh, to your workflow and you'll be able to use some of these new commands we saw like the magic project status and I think uh, file status etc so um, definitely give it a try probably if you're using Melpa you already have it if you are on geeks I know there is a magic 3.0 package that's already on the latest um, in the sorry the, the latest commits of the, Ge the geeks repo so it's out there for everyone to try now and I definitely recommend it and if you haven't used Magic before and you don't know how to use it, then just wait until I post the videos pretty soon because I'm going to take you basically every step of the way through how to use Magic for day to day, you know, just making commits, changing branches, etc. Um, and then we'll go into the more um, advanced functionality of Git using Magic, like uh, rebasing and uh, ref log and stuff like that. And we'll also ex sort of talk about why you would want to do these things because you hear about rebase you hear about ref log and you're like well why would i ever do that well there are pretty good reasons why you would want to do those things so uh we'll learn a little bit about git as well so probably in the next you know three four weeks you'll see the videos for uh, magic come out i already recorded the first one and it's on the computer that blew up and i didn't get the uploaded or copy it off first so um it actually gave me an an, an idea or an opportunity to re-record that video using a different strategy because i think that um it's better to do an end-to-end -end explanation of Magit first to get you started using it and then go into videos to talk about everything else. So I didn't follow that in the first video. So hopefully the new video will be better. All right, let me check on this. All right, let's see. Well, now we're at the point of the stream where, you know, people can just ask questions. We hang out a little bit and, uh, uh, and see if anybody has any interesting thoughts for stuff to discuss. Uh, Tomas says, plus one for Magit series, Magit series, Magit series. Uh, I'm still very attached to IntelliJ's uh, Git features. Their three-way three -way merge is super convenient. I don't know. So for three-way merge, I think that you would probably end up using eDiff for that in Emacs. And the thing about eDiff is that it, um, it wants to take control of your entire window setup whenever you try to start it. So I haven't used that. I probably should because it would be helpful to have a three-way three-way merge view, but I just sort of do it the manual way. Let's see. 
Oslo says, thanks for doing these live streams. Yeah, I well, I, I have fun doing them whenever my computer isn't completely blowing up at the same time. Uh, Benoit says, EDF three-way merge is better than IntelliJ. Well, I'm glad that someone has used it and can say whether it's good or not, because I have not used it. Let's see. I was trying to do the live chat thing before. Let me just try one more time and see if I can get that working. Um, yeah, I think I've screwed up the code somewhere. Whoops. Let's go back here. So live crafter.el. So when I try to authenticate... Okay, it actually did authenticate, but it's authenticating with the wrong account. So let me change my... Um, Count. Emacs VDIF. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Volad, thank you uh, for, for, for saying that. So, um, yes. Projects, code. Wow, that's not the right folder path. Projects, code. All right, keys. Let me just switch to my other set of keys here. Ah. What did I do there? Eval. Ah, eval buffer. Okay. So now if I try this again, maybe it will actually give me the authenticate screen. Hmm. Let me, uh, I'm actually going to hide my screen for a second just so we don't expose anything that we don't want to expose here. Give me one second. I'm going to go to webcam view and then I'll try to, uh, to authenticate. Wow. Is it seriously going to just like go straight through? I want to like log out. Maybe I should do that. Um, okay, that's the right account. I don't think it's the right stream, though. So, <laughs> you can see in the reflection of my eyes? Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, let's see. Get current stream. Live crafter. Get current stream. Get current stream. Okay. So, current stream. Nothing. Yeah. Eh. All right. Not going to work, unfortunately. Simon says, the other day my project manager saw my Emacs agenda. He asked around a bit and said he could use it too. I really don't know what to say. How do you get a non-programmer to use Emacs? Well, there are non-programmers who do use Emacs. Um, I've seen a few threads on Reddit where um, people ask if there are people who are not programmers using uh, Emacs. And there are, there are writers. There are lawyers. I saw a person who's a nurse that uses Emacs. Um... It's pretty interesting, the variety of people out there who are using Emacs. Now, whether a person can easily get into writing Emacs Lisp code is another thing, but I do feel that um, writing Emacs Lisp is, if you've never programmed before, I think you can probably do Emacs Lisp pretty easily because all you gotta do is just open up an Emacs Lisp file, start writing code, and then just evaluate it. So it's not like a program where you have to compile it or know how projects work or anything like that. So. I think it's possible that um, a non-programmer could use Emacs successfully, but they're going to need to consult some sources to get started because it's it's not easy to get started if you don't know things about text editors because you, you start off basically with uh, with nothing. If you start Emacs and it's just a, like that blank white screen and you're like, okay, this just looks like notepad, so what's the point? So. Um, Simon, you may have to uh, to tutor your uh, your your project manager if you want to. Pablo says, "I don't think uh, Protoseleos is a pro programmer. Well, he is now. 
I don't think he can say that he's not a programmer anymore. Maybe he's not a programmer by trade, but um, anybody who's writing code is a programmer in my opinion. DT is not a programmer, yes, but he's a programmer. I mean, if you're if you're writing code, you're a programmer. You, you, if, you, if you don't get paid to be a programmer, that doesn't mean you're not a programmer. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, well, so here's the thing about uh, the term programmer or the term developer. Um, I've noticed that there is a lot of reluctance on the part of people who haven't been trained as programmers to call themselves programmers like if you haven't uh if you haven't been be, been paid to to be a programmer or if you haven't gone to school to be a programmer then maybe you feel like you can't call yourself a programmer well that's a lie if you're writing code of any any, any type even if it's just writing uh your emacs configuration code you're a programmer because you're writing code i mean it, you shouldn't have to like put some imaginary barrier between yourself and then thinking of yourself a certain way. It's just like if you are writing a novel, but you've never been published before, you're still a writer if you if that's what you want to do and what you want to be. Um, now, maybe you can't go to a publishing house and say, I'm a writer, and then have them take you seriously, just like you can't walk up to Facebook and say, hey, I'm a programmer, and get them to hire you. However, maybe you could if you're good enough, but I don't think that that is the gauge that you should use to decide whether you can call yourself something. Uh, Benoit says there are some paid programmers worse than ones not paid for it. Yes, absolutely. Basically, it, all these terms, we, we decide what terms mean. You know, human beings have come up with terms. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just use any term for anything. But in this specific case of calling yourself a programmer or not, you can call yourself a programmer if you're writing Emacs configuration. And that's the only code that you've ever written. Um, now, if you start getting into more fine distinction about what type of programmer, like I am a server-side application programmer. Yeah, if you've never written a server-side application, maybe you can't say that you're doing that, but you know, pro programming is a very wide field and um, hobby programming is just as valid as professional programming, in my opinion. I mean, that's sort of the point of this whole channel is that we're, we're setting up our computer configurations for fun because we want to, and you are a programmer, you are a hacker, or whatever you want to call it, if you're doing these things, because it's, it's what you're sort of inclined to do. Benoit says programming is, is essential in this life. Yeah, well, these days, um, if you want to be in control of um, your computing life, I guess, which is pretty much all of life now, then knowing how to program or at least understanding computers and software is very important. Uh, yeah, spreadsheet formulas is actually programming. I mean, it is, um, it, it gets pretty complicated too. I really don't want to have to do it myself. Rodislav says, if all you have is Emacs, everything looks like a nail. Well, if, if you use Emacs, then you're probably the type of person who's looking for uh, rabbit holes and nails to hit. Tomas is already looking ahead to our next uh, digital lifetime where we're all just uh, constructs inside of an AI. Under says, like programming in Scratch. Um, I haven't actually used Scratch before, but I, I imagine that's also valid. Pavel says, Excel is Turing complete. Well, um, maybe it is. I mean, I guess you can use like VBScript in Excel, right? So you've already got an actual programming language in there. Tomas is working on a Google Sheet add-on lately. What do you write that in? Is it like JavaScript or something? Paul says, the thing is, DT and Prot show that it is possible to pick up Emacs and start shaping it to your knees. They won't get into Magit or LSP mode, but you don't need to be a developer to use Emacs. Well, I would think that they would use Magit because they're definitely making commits to Git repositories. Now, whether they use LSP mode or not is another story, because if you're not 
using a, a programming language for that needs a language server. Emacs Lisp does, does not need a language server, but if you're using a language that does need it, you would use LSP mode. I know that um, DT uses Xmonad, and he's also used uh, Qtile. Both of those require um, configuration using the languages that are written, those things are written in, like Python or Haskell. So he could use LSP mode for those, so I, I don't think it rules it out entirely. Benoit says Prot uses VC instead of Magit. That sort of makes sense. The built-in VC seems pretty primitive to me. I've used it a little bit, but uh, yeah, Magit is much better. I am interested in writing some Git scripting with uh, VC, though, because it, since it's built in, it's kind of nice to have some functions in Emacs that allow you to script, um, to script Git actions. I want to do that for dot crafter i think okay tomas says uh prot uh, uses magic st st uh, two for more complex operations yep marcel says there's a serious video on youtube proving that even powerpoint is turning complete well that's that's interesting i haven't heard of that yeah dt is probably uh just too used to command line git I haven't seen him use magic specifically yeah probably not I haven't seen all of his Emacs videos. Well, uh, I'm, I'm happy that my camera did not freeze this whole time. That's a very encouraging thing here. Magic the Gathering is Turing complete. Now that is, uh, is an interesting claim. I think, Matthew, you're going to have to explain that at some point. Uh, Benoit said, remember the Doom within Excel. You know, I heard about that, but uh, it seems like that would be extremely difficult to pull off. I mean, I guess if you treat every cell as a pixel and you do the same kind of rendering to the pixels, but uh, it seems like it would be incredibly slow. Is it like, you know, um, 0 0.025 frames per second or something? Sounds good. <laughs> Osloy says, a piece of grid paper, light and dark chocolate is Turing complete. Well, yeah, at that point, you, you could basically implement anything because if you're using binary or something. Roombas are Turing complete. Well, Roombas are, have an entire computer inside. So let's see. Yeah, nothing else we can do here on this uh, code at the moment. I really need to... Uh, get this working again because I was working on it uh, a little bit yesterday morning and testing it out with a, a private live stream and it was working pretty well until I started hitting the quota issues and then uh, I had to try to fix that and then I left the code in a state that where things weren't working but now like I need a way to, to log out so that's something I don't really know how to do with the YouTube API because I'm not storing a token here But I'll deal with that later. I'm not gonna watch you. I'm not gonna make you watch me try to debug this because there's really no point. A Doom like Easter. Oh, okay, now I saw that the Doom Easter egg in Excel 95 is like um, something like the, uh, the the Windows screensaver that looks like Doom, or actually it looks like Wolf Wolfenstein 3D, I guess. Radoslav says, any idea when plus 0 0.1, 0 0.2 gets fixed? What is that? It's like, you just can't add 0 0.1 and 0 0.2? Is this going to crash my whole stream? It looks, uh, are you saying because it has that 4 at the very end? If you can't see that, I'm in the echo area down here. I added 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, and there's a 4 at the end. That's got to be some kind of uh, maybe truncation issue or something. I didn't even know that was a problem, but I can see how it would be.
Uh, Echo says, why do your variable names have two patterns, single and double slash? Double slash generally indicates that um, a variable or a function is internal to the package. It's just a convention that um, that people follow so that whenever you see a variable or function that has two slashes, you sort of ignore it whenever you're looking at variables or functions in the describe lists. Um, because you can use these variables. These are, these are variables that the user would configure, but these are variables that are sort of internal to the, uh, the package. Obviously, it's Emacs, and you can set any variable you want or call any function you want, so there's nothing stopping you from doing it, but um, this is sort of just a way to indicate to you that, hey, maybe you shouldn't be uh, using these. Anders, if you're trying to paste a link, probably it is not going to allow you to because YouTube is very aggressive about getting rid of links in the chat. Ashra says that the result of that addition is part of the IEEE standard. Maybe. It depends on the size of the, uh, the representation of the floating point numbers, I guess. Let's see. Nothing else interesting to talk about. So it's probably a good time to start winding down the stream. Um, we've been here for a little over two hours. Um, hopefully, the investigation into the new stuff in, in Magic 3.0 was helpful. Um, I know it wasn't as prepared or polished as necessary, but, eh, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. Live streaming, you can sort of do things on the fly, see if it works. And uh, this time, it sort of worked. And uh, for the next stream, I'm going to try to get the live chat integration working so that we don't have to have this little panel on the left side anymore. We'll have an actual Emacs native uh, integration of the chat, which would be pretty cool. Um, and for those of you who, who weren't here earlier, definitely check out the uh, System Crafters chat in uh, the new Libra chat IRC server. I just started the new channel there um, just because it's fun to use IRC inside of Emacs. I'm using the ERC IRC client here. So if you don't know about Libra chat, just go to uh, libra.chat, libra.chat, and um, look into how to connect. And uh, this is like a new alternative to Freenode. So if you want to check out some System Crafters folks there in IRC, then go there. And aside from that, um, I think that's it. So this week, I don't really know what I'm going to do a video on yet. I haven't finished preparing for any videos. I could do a video on things related to Vertigo, or I could go to something else. Not sure yet. I've got some ideas, so I might have to go into that. If anybody has thoughts on uh, videos that I should do, anything related to things we've been doing recently, or just anything in general, definitely feel free to leave a note in the comments, or tell me on IRC or on Discord, or email, whatever you want. And uh, then next Friday, we'll have another live stream. You know, I really should try to do another dot file detective. So maybe I'll try to do that. We'll see if I can get one set up. I gotta, I gotta find my next victim for a uh, dot file detective. And uh, yeah, aside from that, I think that's it for today. So before we go, I'm just gonna say uh, thank you to my sponsors. And once again, I have not updated the screen. For those of you who are sponsors, I apologize uh, for any new sponsors who are not seeing their names here. Uh, I'm actually going to change the way I do this screen. I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to use an image for this anymore. I'm actually going to pull the information into Emacs in a buffer so that I can get it fresh every time and not have to go and manually update a screen. I don't know why I didn't think about this beforehand, but showing it in, in an Emacs buffer actually makes a whole lot of sense. So I'm going to start doing that in the future. Um, so these people have uh, decided to support the work that I'm doing, making videos about uh, GNU Emacs, GNU Geeks, etc. And I'm very thankful to them for deciding to support the channel in this way. If you're interested in also becoming a sponsor of the channel, check out the link below or links below in the description. I'm on both uh, GitHub sponsors and Patreon. There's also links to uh, PayPal and also GitHub sponsors for uh, one-time tips if you would like to do that. Also, if you would like another way to support the channel, definitely just uh, click like on this video and maybe share it with to other people you know who might be interested in these topics. And uh, you know, we, we can maybe grow the community more and have more people to um, wanna talk about Emacs and Geeks with us, which would be really great. 
So until next time, thanks so much for being here today, all of you people who are here in the chat and uh, being very interactive and, and, and participating. I really appreciate it. And until next time, thanks a lot for watching. Happy hacking. We'll see you.